What lies in the economic process, the poisoning of our skies, skies, the poisoning of our rivers, the exploitation of our men and women. And we need to grow our souls. We need to find that balance of life that respects each other, that thinks of the most important thing that this, at this time of the class of the world is not our accumulation of things, is not economic growth which threatens and imperils all life on this planet, including ourselves. That the time has come to grow our souls, to grow our relationships with one another, to create families that are loving and relationships that are loving and communities that are loving. To bring the neighbor back into the hood, which is what Ron Scott is doing. To do organizing in our communities, which is what Kim Kuroi is doing. To bring young people hope and help them see themselves as the solution rather than as the problems that Shay Howell is doing. I mean, there are so many ways in which we can grow our souls and the souls of all of the others. And we can shape the whole world with a new dream. And we have a special responsibility, I believe, as Asian Americans to do that. Because I learned one thing from my father, who was a supporter like many overseas Chinese of the first American Revolution. You know, of course, most of you know that the two Chinese characters for crisis are danger and opportunity. We can approach every crisis not only as a danger, but as an opportunity for us to create something new. We can become creators of a new dream, and few as we are in number, we can play an extraordinary role in the increasingly complex relationships between the East and the West. So thank you for coming here today. Thank you all for honoring me. And look what I've been trying to do for most of my life, become a part of what you want to do to grow our souls. Thank you. So Grace is just beginning, and I'm going to show the pictures here, and then you guys can. So, so, uh, so Grace, I, I pulled up some pictures, old pictures, Facebook pictures, <laughs> and um, I broke them up into different themes because I just think that a lot of people have heard of you and know about your story, but have so many questions for you. So <clears throat> the first set of questions is is around your your childhood. <laughs> oh, you, you can. Can folks see that? It's invisible. Uh, <laughs> it's got a bow on my hair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, isn't that cute? <laughs> so this is um, Grace at uh, four years old. And there's more. Um, here's Grace uh, in more of a bowl cut at 14 years old with her fam. Oh, sorry. Um, here with her two brothers. There was much of younger brothers, Eddie and Harry. Who are also very involved in the movement as and well. I have on my leather jacket. <laughs> Lake. Yeah, the leather jacket's really important. <laughs> and then the other picture here with, uh, it's, it's also here. Um, with yeah, your... that, that's my father. My father, by the way, was a restaurant man. And he died in my house at the age of 95. He, 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 he lost his restaurant. I don't know whether the maid Shimbi means much to you or not, but 
the Marquis shows up in many films from the 30s. And he used to go out every Saturday night by bus to head wait in restaurants in Detroit because he didn't want to give up being a restaurant man. And the last day of his death, he went out in the, with a petition because he had gotten tired going to these restaurants. And he's going to get benches put on the streets for old people. And he fell as he went down the steps and he never regained consciousness. But he and Jimmy really got along well. He lived in the same house as I did with us. And Jimmy took care of him. And he sort of took care of Jimmy also. And it, it, it is, it's very interesting. I think the, the relationship between the African American, Jimmy, who had been brought up in a little town in Alabama where there are more pigs than people, and my father, who had come from China and had a third grade education. So Grace, I think that um, a lot of people definitely don't know what it was like living in the 20s and the 30s and wanted you to talk a little bit about that, but this is the last picture. That's my Jesus Christ picture. <laughs> Eddie took that picture. There's something about me in my early 20s that he felt was like Jesus Christ. <laughs> Grace, can you talk more about you first became politically conscious in the 1930s during the Great Depression? That's when you started studying philosophy and society. And that's also when, of course, you weren't in Detroit at that time, but Detroit was also at that point the center of industry, the center of, of auto industry, and the place that gave birth to the Industrial Union Movement. So, so what, what can we learn from your experience in the 30s, and how do we need to think about our experience today in, in very different ways than, than what, what you experienced in the 30s? Well, I was in my teens and in the sophomore year in college when the Great Depression broke up. And I don't know why I did it, but I dropped all my classes, which were mostly in science, and decided to take philosophy. And if you had asked me what philosophy is all about, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. But somehow I knew that the industrial crisis was not just an economic crisis. Just like the present crisis that we're in, it's not just me but our crisis. It's a crisis of our spirits and of our values. It's the whether we think that having a job and a higher standard of living and a bigger car and a bigger house is what we should be yearning for, or whether we need something that's much closer to what it means to be a human being. To be able to relate to people with love and respect. Grace, could you talk a little bit about how it was growing up as a as a woman, and also growing up Chinese? And you've mentioned it in the videos, and I've seen you talk about it before. But I think, how many of you uh, grew up in the twenties? <laughs> The 30s. So we have some people who kind of know what it's like. Well, you know, uh, those some of you here are not quite as old as I am, as you're old enough to remember what it was like to be asked by Europeans and European Americans, what is your nationality? And when they spoke English as well as I do, they would say, but then you speak English so well. <laughs> and when you, they, 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 were very, they were very, found it very difficult to accept that someone who looked like you 
could be American. And I think what is happening now, and what I'm talking about, what I think about, what is very deep in my heart, is that we who have these sold and lives and all that sort of thing, and don't look American, have a huge role to play in this in the making of the new treaty in this country. And that's the main lesson that I take away from these treaties here in, in the Bay Area. We have a role to play at this time on the part of the world. We need to talk about it, we need to think about it, we need to understand that we are more than we have been conceived ourselves to be and that others have conceived ourselves. Not in terms of power, but in our ability to, to understand what the human race needs at this point in our revolution. So Grace, you, you mentioned how you began studying philosophy and you got a bachelor's degree and then you went on to get a PhD. You were probably one of the first American-born Chinese women uh, in history to get a PhD in any field, probably, certainly philosophy. And yet, most people think of getting a PhD as a step towards...